Hello everyone, welcome back to Seltzertronics. Today we're going to talk about DAX. What are they? Do you need one? How good does it need to be? And lastly, how to choose the one that's right for you. So what is a DAC? Well, these are DACs. This is the Shit Gongnir Multibit. This is the RME ADI2 Pro FS. And this is the Air Codex. All retail between about $1,250 and $1,700. They are moderately high-end DACs. Reviews of each of these are coming up, so subscribe and click that little bell to make sure you don't miss them. So DAC, D-A-C. DAC is an acronym that stands for Digital to Analog Converter. As this rather straight to the point name implies, it converts digital data, essentially a computer file, into an analog waveform that can be amplified and played through speakers to make music. You see, computer files are ultimately discrete in nature, whereas nature is often infinite. For example, I'm going to draw a circle on a piece of paper. And as I move the pencil tip along a curve, the direction is always changing. It doesn't matter how close we zoom in, the drawing is always curved. We will never find two points on that curve connected by a straight line. This is because along that curve, there are an infinite number of points. For this curve to be perfectly captured into a computer, we'd have to record each of those infinite points, which would take an infinite amount of data, which of course we don't have. So when we digitize something that we see, or any analog continuous phenomenon like sound, we can only take a finite or discrete sample of these points. So now I'll take a picture of my curve with my digital camera. Looks great, very natural, very lifelike. But let's zoom in closer, zooming in. As we can see, a digital photograph is really just a composite of tiny discrete pieces called pixels. Fortunately, the main camera on my phone samples the visible light entering its aperture with 16 million points, creating a digital image of 16 megapixels. So as long as I don't look too closely, my imperfect human vision is unable to distinguish them from one another, thus creating the illusion of continuous lines and color gradients. Well, capturing digital music is a similar process. In the real world, sound is a continuous wave. Capturing that wave perfectly would require an infinite amount of data, which is impossible. So we just sample the wave at a finite number of points. An analog to digital converter, or an ADC, samples a wave at regular intervals. Most music these days is captured at regular intervals of about 1 44,100th of a second, or about 44,100 samples per second. This is called the sample rate. Sometimes even faster sample rates are used. While the sonic benefits to humans of higher sample rates are unclear, this is what off is often referred to as high resolution audio. Each of these 44,100 points per second is captured as a number. But remember, while there are an infinite number of real numbers in the real world, in the digital world, even the number of numbers is finite. Specifically, the number of numbers you have is determined by how many bits you can use. This is called the bit depth. Most digital music these days uses 16 bits of depth. With 16 bits, you have exactly 65,536 possible values. So you can see that even here, if we zoom in close enough, we're never quite going to intersect that curve exactly. Now, some music these days uses 24 bits of depth, which gives us nearly 17 million possible values. This allows us to get much, much closer. However, even with 24 bits, it will never be perfect if we just keep zooming in and zooming in further. Now, as a practical matter, whether the sample hits over or under the actual curve and by how much is fundamentally a random process. In other words, it has no inherent signal or meaning. That is, it's just noise that occurs around the actual signal. For this reason, the bit depth is really about the signal to noise ratio. At 16 bits, the noise is almost always going to be below our threshold of hearing compared to the signal we're actually listening to. So that's what an ADC does. Now, what does a DAC do or a DAC do? Well, now that we've taken an infinite continuous wave and chopped it into finite discrete 
pieces, we need to put it back together again into a nice continuous waveform that we can actually hear. Recently, on an internet audio forum, an individual declared that there is no sense in spending any significant amount of money on a DAC because, and I quote, all a DAC does is convert digital to analog. That's it. While true in a superficial sense, I had to ask, mm, what makes somebody think that that is a straightforward or simple process? Sometimes people talk about converting digital data into music as if it's as simple as an adapter to plug their laptop into a European hotel. Let me offer you a different perspective. It's perhaps a bit overly illustrative, but it's closer to the truth than the former. Put simply, DACs don't convert music, they make music. I'll explain that statement, but first, let's talk about how an analog system works. In a pure analog recording, a musician plays a note. The note is a pressure wave moving through the air in the studio that impacts and vibrates a membrane on a microphone. The frequency and amplitude of those vibrations are a direct reflection of the sound pressure wave that created them. Within the microphone, the vibrating membrane moves a magnet relative to a coil, which translates that kinetic energy into an electrical current. That electrical current can be used to magnetize metal tape, which could be subsequently turned back into a current to drive a speaker or maybe a cutting stylus through a lacquer disc that could be pressed onto vinyl. Want to do something cool? Take an old vinyl record and look at it closely. Shift it somewhat under the light. Do you see all that texture? Guess what? That's the actual waveform of your music embedded into the grooves. When you put that record on a turntable, the rotation of the platter will drag the tiny needle, or stylus, through the groove, causing the needle to vibrate just so. The vibration of the needle, in turn, will move a magnet across a coil, or vice versa, in order to turn that physical motion back into an electrical current that can drive speakers. Once again, by using the current to push a magnet. There may be lots of conversions here between kinetic energy, electrical currents, and magnetic fields in the process, but at all times the continuous or analog nature of the waveform is preserved. In a very real way, this is a direct physical chain of events connecting the musician's strum of the guitar and your eardrum. Who made the music? The musician did. With digital music, however, there is a physical discontinuity. For a period of time, the music ceased to exist. Recall, a digital music file, whether PCM or DSD, isn't actually music at all. It's just a sequence of numerical values representing single points on an analog waveform, sampled many thousands of times per second. In other words, it's a data set. In fact, here is what your typical MP3 or FLAC file looks like when you open it up. When I plot it in a graph over time, I guess you can say it's starting to look like music, but it isn't. It's just data. For a DAC, however, these data are like a set of very detailed notes, not wholly unlike musical notation. Just like a musician can read the notation on a sheet as a guide for creating music on an actual instrument, a DAC uses digital notation to reconstruct a new analog waveform that nearly perfectly matches the original. Now, the mechanics and mathematics of this are more precise and regular than the way a musician reads sheet music, but my point is thus. A DAC is more like a musician than a simple adapter. A DAC creates music. So why do I need a DAC? My computer, phone, sound card, etc. already spits out analog, right? Well, for most people, yeah, you're right, you don't need a DAC. DACs are built into just about everything these days, including our televisions, laptops, our phones, our Bluetooth headphones, our wireless speakers, and so forth. Unless you're an audiophile really interested in pursuing high-fidelity sound, or hi-fi, the DACs embedded in all of our digital devices are typically good enough. But for the music lover or gamer who wants to really heighten their sonic experiences, yes, you do. Think of it this way. You can buy a violin for a few hundred dollars. It will play. If you play it well, it will sound pretty good. You can sing and dance to it and have a grand old time. 
yet the world's best violinists play violins worth hundreds of thousands of dollars or even millions of dollars. So what makes one DAC better than another? A lot of times on audio forums and inevitably in the comment section on this video, I hope, you hear people say stuff like, all DACs sound the same. Their position is typically supported by claims like, a good DAC chip costs five to $10 and they all pretty much use the same chips. DAC chips here refers to the actual chip that does the digital to analog conversion. Or something like, well, the fundamentals of digital to analog conversion were worked out in the 1980s. Well, yes, those support claims are basically true, but the conclusion is still incorrect due to missing premises. That view is simply too narrow. An actual DAC, not just the DAC chip, like one of these boxes, right, that we can actually buy, is much more than the DAC chip. In order to assess why one DAC can be better than another, let's look at the four basic sections that comprise a modern DAC. First, the digital interface. The digital interface receives a digital signal from a digital source, like a PC, digital streamer, a CD player, or even a video game console. There is actually a surprising amount that can go wrong here. Depending on the specifics of the situation, this may or may not involve bi-directional communication between the source and the DAC, a certain amount of noise rejection, digital to digital conversion, that is converting the format of an incoming digital signal into something the DAC chip can actually use. Remember, the music was originally sampled 44,100 times per second. To put the music back together, we need to be absolutely precise about this in the same way a musician reading music needs to be on time. If not, the music sounds wrong. Thus, a DAC needs a really good clock inside it that helps the DAC make music in the same way a metronome helps a musician play an instrument. The digital interface will also determine a number of important features of the DAC. For example, what kinds of inputs does the DAC accept? Does it only have USB or does it also has SPDIF, coaxial and optical? How about HDMI or AES? After the digital interface, some DACs might even have powerful processors for applying digital signals processing or DSP, like digital equalization and digital volume control. Then we have the DAC chip itself. This is what actually converts the digital signal to an analog waveform. But there are different approaches to doing this. The three main approaches include the delta sigma method, resistor ladders, and field programmable gate arrays, or FPGA. I won't get into the specifics, but they work in different ways that each have distinct advantages and disadvantages and can thus impart a bit of character on sound. Additionally, the DAC chip will also determine the kinds of formats and standards that a DAC ultimately supports, such as high resolution PCM formats and standards like 24 bit 192 PCM or DSD or MQA. Some DACs even use multiple DAC chips, sometimes in complete parallel streams, processing left and right channels independently to feed a balanced signal into the analog section of the DAC. The DAC chip itself will produce an analog waveform, but it's very low power. To connect it with the rest of your audio equipment, it needs to be boosted up to standard levels. Thus, a DAC is in a sense also a kind of analog amplifier and has all the same technical challenges in doing that. To get a good, clean signal output, you need a high quality analog output stage, imparting the least amount of noise and distortion to the signal while amplifying it up to higher levels. As well, the design of the analog section will also determine the kinds of outputs a DAC has. Will it be unbalanced only or will it have balanced outputs? How many outputs will it have? Like other electronic devices, a DAC relies upon steady direct current, or DC power. Yet alternating current, or AC, is what comes out of the wall. Since every other part of the DAC runs on DC power, a DAC needs a high quality power supply to supply it with a steady, clean power, free of noise and residual unsuppressed alternation in the current that it needs to do its job. In sum, the overall quality of a DAC is determined by the overall implementation of these four sections, how well each is designed and how well they are designed and built to work with each other. So you want to do better than the basic DAC or the basic violin that came with your computer or your cell phone or whatever. How much do you need to spend? Fortunately, 
Just like you don't need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a violin that sounds good, you don't need to spend hundreds of thousands to get a good sounding DAC. However, you can generally always do better than the one you have if you have the coin. First, let's talk about two important concepts, diminishing returns and diminishing marginal utility. Think about the first violin in the London Symphony. At that level, every little bit counts, no matter what the price. But that doesn't mean that a $300,000 violin is 300 times better than a $1,000 violin, especially if you're not the first violinist in the London Symphony and just, well, an amateur. Diminishing returns is essentially the boundary you run into when you're only upgrading a single piece of your equipment at a time. For example, if you're only rocking a pair of circa 2004 Dell desktop computer speakers, it doesn't much matter what kind of DAC you have. Looking at this graph, we see the return or utility we get from ever more expensive DACs. Here, this is the cost of a DAC on the x-axis and the amount of utility or return we get on the y-axis. With $50 speakers, you will get virtually no additional benefit from the best DAC in the world over the one built into your Dell PC. However, as you continue to upgrade the speakers in tandem, the benefits get room to shine. Secondly, diminishing marginal utility. This is similar to diminishing returns, but all it's saying is that each additional dollar you spend on virtually anything never gives you the same benefit as the previous dollar. For example, you can get a DAC on Amazon for $10. That will take you from no digital audio capability to digital audio. You basically advanced 100 years since the advent of the phonograph for $10. Pretty monumental. But after that, the marginal utility begins to decrease at an increasing rate ultimately to the point where you spend tens or even hundreds of thousands of dollars to get the teeniest, tiniest improvement, not unlike the first violin in the London Symphony. So what difference does it all make? Well, with computer and video games, I can say straightforwardly, it will greatly improve the three-dimensional image gamers depend on to locate themselves relative to enemies and event events unseen. It can help a gamer discern the direction and motion of other objects and so forth. Many popular AAA games like Overwatch and Call of Duty contain detailed environmental audio engines designed to produce these sonic effects, but without a good DAC, they may be lost on you in the same way that some advanced graphical features may be lost on you if you don't have an adequate graphic. When it comes to digital music, however, the difference a DAC makes is much more difficult to put one's finger on. The differences they make tend not to be the kind that are as obvious as I noticed a bump in the bass at 120 hertz, or this DAC has a fun V-shaped frequency response. So let me start by telling you something I like to do when I test my DACs. I close my eyes and I try to envision what I hear in the mind's eye. I imagine all of these different sound objects in space, what they look like, and then I draw them. I'm an awful artist, so forgive the shoddy drawing here, but these little twinkles are what I see from about 1 minute to 1 minute 40 seconds in Daft Punk's Within from the album Random Access Memories. They're actually just like little hits of a hi-hat or a cymbal. I don't know, it just you hear them just sort of flickering in the, in the darkness and on a low-quality DAC. It's almost, well, they just don't seem to have the kind of dimension. You can see there's something there and just sort of a blip, right? But then, but on a good DAC, you can hear that it's so much more than a little blip. It's like a, a twinkle in the darkness, not a blip. It has dimension. It has sparkle. It has shape and contour. I just somehow seem to see so much. I see it, I see the front of the blip and it as it fades into three dimensions. It fades left and right and it fades back as it sparkles forward. There's so much more that I can appreciate. These here are some astronomical images of the Her Hercules cluster, in this case with a small telescope in dark skies here with a medium telescope, and here with an even larger telescope. 
you can start to see how mm, features form details detail space between the details begins to emerge this I liken to the sound of a good DAC. You hear the space between the strings of a guitar. You hear the reverberation slowly dissolving into a black background. Taken together, these nuances come together to produce a richer, more dimensional presentation of a track. When I test DACs, I always try to imagine in my mind's eye the location of different sounds, instruments, and so forth. For example, you might discover that some of those low-level details you always just took for being quieter relative to the other parts of the track aren't quiet per se, but rather they are distant in the background. Thus, a three-dimensional soundstage can emerge holographically or no, holophonically in front of you. There is a keen sense of direction, not only of left and right, but also up and down and even forward and back. With all instruments and sound objects correctly rendered in it, their own proper place on a stage of sound. This is why gamers can benefit so much from a good DAC, as many of the benefits of a good DAC are spatial. Higher end DACs tend to have more natural sound, as if what you're hearing is not being reproduced through speakers, but from actual instruments. Some DACs may impart a kind of energy and vigorousness, assaulting the senses with forward details. Others may sound more laid back or relaxed. Some may have a bit of added warmth or smoothness, while others may be more cool and analytical sounding, as if you're trying to not so much enjoy the music, but are keen to hear and appreciate the tiniest plankton or the tiniest details in the recording, like the sound of a, of a musician's blocked right nasal passage when he breathes. Higher-end decks also tend not to have many or any outright flaws that lower-end and entry-level decks do. For example, a good DAC is free from any kind of harshness or crunchiness in the highs. Highs are detailed and airy, but never off-putting. In fact, for me, this is one of the major differences between a mid-fi DAC and a hi-fi DAC. A mid-fi DAC may have all of that detail up in the highs, but they may not be presented in an enjoyable way. A low-end DAC may have a bit of looseness in the bass. Especially if you're into electronic music, hip-hop, and trap, a lot of times we're accustomed to just big slamming bass that kind of has this indistinct power of rolling thunder. But there can actually be a lot of detail in there. More so with natural instruments, bass can have shape and contour. On a really good jazz recording, on a good system, you'll notice that the bass notes coming off the big stand-up bass isn't like the bass in a club, but it has contour and texture to remind you that it's coming off a real instrument played with fingers. So in sum, what difference does a DAC make? It's essentially like asking what difference does a violin make? At first you may not hear the difference, but as you listen and become more of a gourmand of sound, aka an audiophile, the emergence of subtleties and presentation become increasingly important to you. Yes, you can get by with a lesser quality DAC, but as you progress, new DACs can deepen your relationship to the music and even to the artists themselves. They can allow you to experience your favorite songs in a whole new way, discovering something new, to you at least, some new dimension about them that you never experienced before. For these reasons, upgrading and testing DACs are some of my favorite audiophile things to do. So how do you choose the right DAC for you? First, consider your use case. How are you going to be using this DAC? Will you be using it at home in a hi-fi system? Will it be part of a gaming rig? Will it be used in the office with some headphones on the go with a portable rig? There are many different kinds of DACs, each designed to suit your specific use case. Secondly, consider your connectivity requirements, your desired features and support for stuff you want to do with it. For example, what kind of digital inputs do you need? Do you need USB? SPDIF? Do you need AES? What analog outputs do you need? Single-ended or balanced? How many do you need? Do you need DSD or MQA support? Lastly, decide on a budget. Many people offer some kind of mathematical formula, like a DAC should be 20% of your system, amp 30%, and speakers 50%. 
Formulas like this, unfortunately, make only some sense in the simplistic case of one DAC, one amp, one pair of speakers. Many of us have multiple sets of speakers and or headphones we like to mess with, implying multiple amplifiers and so forth. A DAC rests pretty high up in the audio chain, meaning that a single DAC can feed multiple amplifiers, improving sound quality from a variety of digital sources, including, but not limited to, a digital music player, a PC, a video game console, or even a TV. Thus, in considering how much money you're willing to allocate to a DAC, you should consider that the benefits of the DAC will be spread over multiple inputs and outputs. For me, this justifies spending more than some percentage-based formula. Just decide on how much you want to spend. This is just a crude estimation based on experience, but DAC performance price categories look something like this. Entry level. Entry level is better than what's in your TV, phone, laptop, or whatever. Generally, we're looking at about $70 to $150 here. It works, it ups your game. Around $150 to $250, this is what we'll just call entry level plus. In my opinion, this is where things start really getting good. More features, more inputs and outputs, improving sound quality. Some of those hidden dimensions and details are starting to emerge. At this point, you don't really have to be a golden-eared audiophile to appreciate the difference. Mid-Fi, about $250 to $750. Your system sounds really good. Few obvious flaws like harshness in the highs or flat imaging. This will really impress your guests and combined with a similar quality amp and speakers, now you're beginning to earn a reputation for being the hi-fi guy. Mid-Fi Plus, around $750 to $1,500, you're getting serious about audio equipment now. Pro gamers and even sound engineers can do very well at this level. This excites you because sound and music are your hobby. You no longer cringe at the term audiophile. You're becoming a gourmand of sound. People around you are less able to connect with what you're doing, having exhausted their interest and in sitting quietly in the sweet spot of your room listening to neo-crooners like Diana Krall. I mean, Diana Crawl? Seriously? You don't even like Diana Crawl. What are we listening to Diana Crawl for? Hi-Fi. About $1,500 to $3,000. It just doesn't get much better than this. No flaws. You justify the price of your equipment relative to the amounts other people spend on fancy mountain bikes, golf clubs, and riding lawnmowers. At this point, audio is becoming a central part of your life. You plan on a long-term investment plan into high-end equipment. You either have or are planning for a dedicated audio room or music listening spaces. You're as picky about what music you listen to as you are about who touches your equipment and how. Even music you've loved your entire life is becoming, becoming unlistenable because of awful mastering. But here you are listening to some avant-garde experimental noise from Iceland because it's in DSD 128 and has a DR score of 21. At this point, the people around you assume you have some sort of disease. Hi-Fi Plus, 3,000 to 6,000. Even better. You can tell any reel-to-reel -reel analog lover that the reason why they think reel-to-reel -reel is best is because they've just never heard how amazing digital can be. And you'd be right. However, marginal returns on an additional dollar are very low at this point. But that doesn't matter to you because audio is your passion. You justify the extreme cost relative to what others spend on fancy cars, motorcycles, motorhomes, and lives filled with world travel. Keep in mind, your speakers are probably upwards of ten dollars to $20,000 now. So unless you make really good money, your life is becoming hmm, possibly a bit unbalanced. If you're a normal person with a normal income, you probably need to go clothes shopping. Yes, other people think so too. Summit Fi. DAX costing tens of thousands of dollars or even hundreds of thousands of dollars. I have only limited experience with these DAX and I'm certainly not apart from the Summit Fi showrooms they're found in. I mean, I've never actually heard one of these in my system or a system that I'm especially familiar with. I've only heard them next to... 70, 80, 100,000 dollar speakers, so I can't really tell you much about them. I assume they're slightly better than Hi-Fi Plus, but marginal utility of each dollar spent here must be diminishing to near zero. In other words, if you have the scratch to buy this kind of stuff, yes, 
it can be better. However, for us normal peasants, we can take comfort in knowing that for a tithing, we can get 99% of the way there. So what should you do? Based on this framework, identify your desired price range and get the best deal on the highest price tag you can justify. Many people will say go with measurements, but honestly, price correlates with sound quality better than measurements do. For example, a website popular with audiophile objectivists these days is known for being very critical of shit audio DACs because they measure poorly. Well, they might measure poorly, but they still tend to sound very good and are in good standing relative to the competition at their various price points. As a consumer and as an empiricist, it's quite disappointing that within the audio world, price typically correlates better with sound quality than measurements do. That's not to say that measurements don't have their place. We aren't free to ignore them or basic principles of physics, but it's important to understand measurements in context. This is also why I favor blind testing where possible. It dramatically reduces the effect of co cognitive bias, but also relies on actual hearing. So there you have it. Dax in a nutshell. Or perhaps a nut house. Mm, I don't know. Thank you for watching. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe. But remember, only true audiophiles will click that little bell to make sure that you get all the latest from Celtronics.